Good morning, everyone. It's the Drive to School podcast. Hope summer was all right. We're getting back into things. The apologist, the wonderful David Zills is back here. How are you doing today? I'm doing all right, uh, Harrison. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks so much for being with us. Uh, David, when we sit down, we talk about apologetics. We talk about the defense of the faith. Um, and, and so, I, I mean, I guess let's just dive right into it. It's uh, it's the invisible friend question. Like, it's great that you believe in it, but how do you know that you this is any different from having an invisible friend when you were a toddler? Yeah, I know uh, that's been a struggle for me. Um, as I've talked about previously, um, kind of the idea of, is this all in my head? Um, and um, there's a lot of ideas in our culture that are competing with Christianity to tell you kind of the, the story of what life is about. And, you know, any of these things, um, you know, you could believe them. But the question is, how do you pick one? How do you know which one is the best system to live your life by? And I think that's an important question. And, you know, it's not one we should shy away from as Christians. Right. There, there are a lot of other options out there besides Christianity. And like, I, I, it's, it's almost foolish to sort of put ours on the pedestal just because we happen to be inside of that particular faith. Right? Yeah, I think, I think it, um, you know, some people will say agnosticism is a great worldview. And I think in some ways, agnosticism is a great starting point because there comes a point where you can't just accept something because someone told you and you kind of have to ask yourself, well, what about me? But I don't think agnosticism is a great ending point because like we all need answers. We need to know what life is about. And so that search is, is important. Right. Agnosticism almost it, it, it almost revels in sort of that that ignorance where you can like you can wave the answer in front of somebody's face and, and say, here it is. And, and they say, well, yeah, but how can we be sure? Um, how do you eat dinner if that's the case? Like, how can you live the rest of your life that way? Um, either there's food in the refrigerator or there's not. Sooner or later, you're going to have to check. Yeah, yeah. So I think that there there's flavors of agnosticism. There's I don't know. And then there's the, I can't know, which is kind of actually more dogmatic that I think it can even support itself. Um, Cause how do you know, you can't know, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of <laughs> defeats itself, <laughs> but then there's the, I don't want to know, or I'd, I like the fact that it's ambiguous and there's something to be said for being a free thinker, but the thinking should lead you toward truth and not just to stay in uncertainty forever. Um, so I think it's important to think about, you know, what's, what are the criteria we use to evaluate worldviews? How do we, how would we know the right worldview, the right story of reality when we saw it? And, um, and I know we'll talk more about this in future sessions. There are a couple criteria. Um, one is that there are two truth-based criteria for worldview. One is, does it, is it consistent with itself? It's co called coherence. Does it contradict itself? Um, and that's kind of a logical, you know, does it, you know, you kind of have to go through the logic of, does it say something is true and then say it's false? And it can get a little mind bending, but it's important to think through, you know, is this consistent with itself? The other one that I think, you know, is worth spending more time on it as far as a truth test for a worldview is, does it match the facts? Um, so one is, does it match itself? The other one is, does it match the facts? And it's easy to come up with a lot of systems that are internally consistent. So right. the real challenge is, does it fit with the facts of how people, of what people experience in their day-to-day -day lives? And so we'll talk a lot about this different kind of evidences, you know, very objective, you know, how can I know this is real and it's not just my invisible friend? Um, and I think that's really important. But before we dive into that, I think it's good to talk a little bit about another test, which uh, it's not a test for truth, but it's a test for livability. Um, mm -hmm. And it's the question of how it's, it's like a meaning based test. How does this worldview help me deal with life and give meaning to life? And it may be that the worldview that's true gives me no meaning. And so truth takes priority, but kind of in the back of our mind, it's helpful to think, what are the implications if this is true? And how does it help me deal with the reality of human experience? Um, so yeah, I'd like to spend a little time talking about that and kind of thinking, how would we evaluate different worldviews popular today in terms of the meaning test for worldviews? 
Right. And that meaning is important. Like I remember in high school, they made us read Camus where, you know, he walks on a beach and has an existential crisis that nothing matters at all. And the best thing we could learn is that nothing matters at all. And, and nothing means anything but you, you kind of we were talking before and you said today we're actually in a very different place one uh uh than when i was in high school back in the 1900s where meaning is 1900s that's day. hilarious <laughs> don't make me feel that old oh it's <laughs> terrible yeah uh, my kids started doing that to me and, and i love it <laughs> oh, that's hilarious time. um <laughs> back in the 1900s movies like the titanic are actually still relevant for today yeah it makes me hey. feel old there we go. Uh, but but now you're right. There's meaning attached to, to almost everything. So so how do we start to sort through all of this? Yeah. So I know, like you said, when we were younger, the, the kind of the worldview challenger to Christianity was scientific naturalism. And like you said, it led to this Albert Camus like despair because basically it said the view of reality is that reality, there is no God, there is no meaning you know, we're just a bunch of chemicals, you know, if you love someone, that's great, but that's just a bunch of chemical reactions in your head. And if they tell you they love you, that's really just a bunch of chemical reactions in their head. So if you want to kill a love letter, just tell the person you love that the chemicals in your brain make you feel really good when you think about them. Like there's something intuitive in us that says, wow, that just took the wind out of that. Right. And so, and that's exactly what this this chemical physical view of reality did it said if all of life is chemistry and physics then all the things that matter to life aren't really real and so you kind of end up in this despair where nothing matters um and so that was kind of the that scientific naturalism you know science 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 that was the thing that was big when i think you and i were younger these days the pendulum has swung the other way where um we need that meaning. We can't just live and say, well, nothing matters. Like it doesn't, it doesn't work. And so we need the meaning, but because modern culture has told us that there is no objective meaning, there's nothing in the world that gives meaning kind of the, the logical conclusion is, well, then I have to define meaning for myself. And so that's where we are in the postmodern world is the ultimate value, the ultimate thing that matters in life is my freedom to define love and meeting for myself. And because that's the most important thing for me, it's also the most important thing for everyone else, which means I am not supposed to impose my view of love and meaning on other people. And so there's this idea that I somehow am able to create meaning and love for myself. And I keep saying meaning and love because I'm tipping my hand. I think the two are intricately related. Right. Um, and it's, it's important to recognize then when we start to talk about things like faith with a world around us, it's not an all or nothing thing like it used to be. It's not sort of reasoning somebody back from the, the, the break of despair, but it's, it's that you're ripping apart their worldview and their hope. Um, and, and so if it's just about being right, there's no love attached to that. Um, but also if we're just going to point out why other things are wrong, uh, sooner or later, you're going to have to replace that with hope. No, I think that's huge. I think Christians have taken a lot of flack and in some ways it's deserved for always pointing out what's wrong with the culture. We're against this, that, and the other, but like you said, it comes off unloving if we don't present the alternative that we're for and explain why it's actually better. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think about that with, you know, if you were to look at meaning from a postmodern view and from a Christian view, you know, what would be the alternative vision from postmodernism where everybody is accepted and loved regardless of how they define acceptance and love, but it's all contingent on us loving each other. It's all conditional love. We have to get it and receive it from each other. And I think there's something powerful in Christianity and that we're, uh, our meaning is derived from love that isn't contingent on someone else's ability or willingness to love us, or it is, but we know we're guaranteed that it's there. So maybe to be more specific, um, there was a book I read, I think in high school or college, I have it here, Donald Miller, really great guy, um, outside the box thinker, great Christian, but he kind of thinks outside the box and that's searching for God knows what. And it tells his uh, faith journey where he was kind of like, you know, how do I know any of this God stuff is real? I don't. And so he told God that God didn't exist, which he later realized there was 
irony and telling God that God doesn't exist. But then he kind of started living life and he started noticing things about human nature that actually helped him make sense of Christianity. And there was this the, kind of the main theme in there is this idea that as a human being, I am wired so that other people tell me who I am. You know, there's this huge push to define myself and believe in myself, but I, I don't know about um, you, but when I do that, I always doubt myself. I'm always like, well, how do I know? How do I know I'm on the right track? I mean, do other people like me? And so there's this idea that we need external validation. Um, and so where Donald Miller goes with that is that actually makes perfect sense in a Christian worldview, because Christianity says there was a time when we had that external validation and then an, something happened and now it's lost. And so we're looking for it everywhere. We look for the people we think matter in life. We need them to tell us we matter. And like, it's like an obsession. I mean, you can see it everywhere in our culture. If you look, you can see it. I see it in my own life. There are so many times where I'm always I'm doing one thing, but under the surface, I'm actually just begging for affirmation. Um, it comes kind of the all, undercurrent. All to itself then. I mean, especially sort of running it uh, through through that sort of lens that you're talking about, that we, we received our, our you know affirmation, our validation before the fall directly from God. And after the fall, we're, we're trying to find God in everything that's not God, where we're, it's idolatry. Right. And this is another book I have, um, Making Sense of God by Tim Keller, a little heavier. The Donald Miller book is um, very poignant, very raw, very conversational. You kind of laugh. He makes, he's very self-deprecating. The Tim Keller book, he dives into a little bit more of like current cultural thinkers and stuff. But yeah, he talks about that idolatry where we have different kinds of longings as human beings. And some of them are like nice to have, like, I kind of want ice cream right now. You know, those don't really direct the trajectory of our life, but they're important longings. Like I am lonely. I want companionship. I want to belong, but above that. And if we don't get this right, all the other longings will be out of whack. There's an ultimate longing. And those ultimate longings are to be valuable for someone to say, we matter no matter what and that we are loved no matter what. And if that ultimate longing is directed at non-ultimate things like other people, we're always going to be a slave to those things. And they're going to be a slave to us because they're never going to be, be able to deliver the ultimate satisfaction we need because they're looking for it themselves. And so the way out of this, in the, Tim Keller and Donald Miller both talk about is to get the validation from God. And to realize that that is, first of all, to get that validation. But if you don't think that validation matters as much as other people, it, it won't matter to you. So kind of thinking about why do I care so much about what other people think and kind of breaking that down and deconstructing that and replacing it with something much more solid that is life-giving and comes from outside myself and isn't subjective, but is based on something concrete and real and ultimate. I mean, the, the creator of me and everything else, you know, who obviously, you know, has the most to say about who we are. Right, he would know better. Um, and, and that's that's fantastic that we're we're sort of of that one thing that we're desperate to find. That's actually the basic assumption of Christianity that it's already there. Um, it, it really does sort of free you to look at your neighbor um, as as a gift instead of a giver. Um, and, mm -hmm. and those are important distinctions because I, I mean, gifts are great, but at the same time, um, they're, they're, they're always a little bit incomplete uh, because it, it's, it's a smaller part of a larger whole. Um, but we start with that, that assumption that you, you have value because Christ paid for you with his precious blood, blood and death. Like there, there's more value there than anything else in this world. We, we start with the idea that, that Christ who has redeemed you from sin has forgiven all of it, even the stuff that you haven't done yet. Um, so that your identity in Christ and your baptism will never ever change and and so uh when you start to look at your neighbor you don't need to earn anything uh this is actually that's just Lutheran doctrine but it, it's um it, it's it's the core of justification and and where we find our hope yeah and I think uh you know part of talking about Christianity in our context we have to use different language because like everything you said has been believed for thousands of years 
But if you say it in the way the catechism says it, people will look at you and kind of scratch their head. But you can say the same thing using modern words, and it's not compromising truth, but right. people will get it. And if you talk about the fact that if God is for us, who could be against us, you know, straight out of Romans, he who did not spare his own son, um, like that's, that's incredible love. And the fact that God is for us, like that is what we need. We need someone who we think matters to be for us. And that's what we're always searching for in life. And if that's what God has given us unconditionally, in spite of the fact that we don't deserve it, like that, that's incredibly freeing. Absolutely. That's brilliant. Um, yeah, I, 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 I can't top that. Is there anything else we want to kind of talk about today? No, no, I think we covered a lot already. That, I, yeah, that was like drinking out of a fire hose. It was amazing. Thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, yeah. Looking forward to next time. Can't wait.